North Carolina has lost seven straight games at Virginia dating back to 2013. Pat Kilby, I say it's high time we start a new streak. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, January 10th, 2020. Three. I got it right, Pac. I've said 2022 the last two shows. We're doing work. We're winning already. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade. Joining me on a Tuesday, it's usually Wednesday, is our guy, Coach Pac Kilby. He's got a game tonight, Tuesday night, and so we recorded for Tuesday's show. We want to thank you for joining us, making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen or watch every day single day. We are recording this in the immediate aftermath of the national championship game blowout. Uh, Georgia Bulldogs back-to-back national champions just absolutely wiping out TCU pack. I gotta be honest, I think Pentatonix had the second best performance on that field tonight. Uh, Matt, just like TCU, great, great season. Way to go, but Georgia, they're just something something else, something different. So we do want to spend our show today getting ready for the Virginia game. As I said, Carolina has lost seven in a row on the road at Charlottesville in JPJ Arena, and so got some work to do. So we want to get you ready for the Cavs. We want to talk about things we're watching for, make game predictions. But first, I want to spend a couple minutes off the top talking about how the Tar Heels have been playing more through Armando Baycott lately and how that has helped kind of like put stuff in a much better direction and, and given um, just more consistency, I believe to this team offensively. Let, Pac, let me just give a couple numbers and then we'll begin to unpack this some in terms of uh, just like a little, I don't want to go deep dive on the usage, but for example, Adrian Atkinson at Freeport kid on Twitter does great Great stuff analyzing Carolina um, and, and their plays and sets and percentages and things like that. Give him a follow if you don't already. Um, but one of the things he points out is Carolina had a season high 39 post entries against Notre Dame on Saturday. And, and it's things like that. Even to the eyeball test, you can just see that the Tar Heels are, are um, being more determined to just feed the post possession after possession after possession, and they have to. Like, they need to play through the ACC preseason player of the year, and the guy that I think right now is the ACC player of the year. Um, he's making better decisions when when to score, when to find a cutter, when to kick out. He's going to do a lot of kicking out in this game against Virginia because they're going to bring those double teams hard like they do. As for Armando himself, as I look at his stats pack, I am beginning to see a clear demarcation line of pre-Virginia Tech when he sat out and post-Virginia Tech when he came back. There were eight games before that, seven games so far since. Let me just give it to you in terms of what he's done with assists and turnovers in that time frame. (laughs) Those first eight games pre-Virginia Tech where he sat out, how many assists did he have? Eight. One assist per game in the first eight games. Total assists in the seven games since, 18. 18 assists in the last seven games, 12 in just the past three games. That's insane. What about turnovers? Well, as assists have gone up, turnovers have gone down, and that is crazy impressive. Those first eight games, 27 turnovers for Armando. That's an average of 3.38 turnovers per game. The seven games since, he only has 11 turnovers. That's an average of 1.57 turnovers per game. He has cut his average turnovers per game in half since sitting out against Virginia Tech. In the first eight games, how many games with zero turnovers do you think he had, Pat Kilby? Uh, One, maybe. Zero. None. Had at least one turnover in all eight of those first eight games. What about since then? In the seven games since Virginia Tech, how many games do you think he's had with zero turnovers? Two. 
three. He yeah. has had three of the past seven games, zero turnovers. And so you, you just see not only is Carolina playing through Armando Moore, but he is being more efficient and effective, both in terms of scoring the ball and being a decision maker and facilitator. That's a big part of why I believe the Tar Heels are playing a lot better. Pac, what do you see um, as, as your coaching eyes look at it, as Carolina mm -hmm to me, is clearly making a definitive effort to play more through Armando. Agree or disagree? Absolutely, I agree. And, I mean, it just obviously it makes sense that you want your best player to have the ball in his hands. But here's the deal, and this is what makes it so good and so effective, is Armando's not a black hole when he gets it in there. And he's finding his guards on the perimeter, especially as the double teams have been coming. And that makes the guards go, oh, I can get an open shot. Let me throw it to him. I know I'll get it back. And, like, things that I know we'll talk about down the line, but R.J. Davis's three-point percentage is climbing. Well, it's really not hard to figure out why. <laughs> been, you know, we've been getting the ball into the post. It's collapsing the defense. He's kicking it out, and he's getting better shots. And so, to me, it just it makes us better. And it makes the other team struggle more when the ball's in our best player's hands. It's it's really, you know, quite simple. Yeah, it seems like it, it's a confusing thing, but it's really not. Give, yeah. the, our, give the ball to Armando, create space, let him go to work. That's a winning recipe for ACC basketball this season. I mean, literally, the first possession of the Notre Dame game, he gets the ball in the post, they bring a hard double. What does he do? Finds Caleb Love in the corner, bang beautiful looking three Caleb gets some confidence he's off and running and has one of his best games of the season in terms of three-point shooting great stuff there you love to see it a anything else on um like that level of efficiency or, or things you're seeing I mean how much let me ask you this Pac how much do you think Carolina should send Armando to the post and just say hey we're going to give you the ball operate versus using what's also that really effective pick and roll game with RJ up top. Well, gosh, I don't know if you can quite put a percentage on it and say 60, okay. 40, but here's what I like. I think in what we've been doing really well early in possessions, we've been running him, you know, rim running him. Yep. Let's see if we can get it to him on the block early. Okay. Now the shot clock's winding down. All right, let's get into some of our ball screen action and see if we can't get a good look. I like that. I think that's a good mix. If we can get it to him early, collapse the defense, let him go score, let him find someone on the perimeter, great. That's easy buckets. That's really what we would call secondary transition offense. You know, like we're not just getting a wide open, you know, catch and shoot layup, but, you know, we are making a post entry. And then if it's not there, all right, boom, we're straight into our – you know, get it to RJ, get it to Caleb, get it, get, get your ball screen, open up the post a little bit and see if, see if they can't go collapse the defense and create something for themselves or for their teammates. And, and when we're utilizing this three guard lineup more now, all the more space you have to operate in that pick and roll um, situation. And so um, love Carolina's trust to be able to say, all right, early shot clock, we got a plan. We're getting in, kicking out if necessary, repost whatever it needs to be. And, and if nothing's working there, <laughs> good luck choosing whether you want to guard RJ or Armando rolling or somebody on the wing, whatever it's going to be, we're going to beat you. And so you, you got to feel confident that one way or another, Carolina is going to score efficiently. And that's why they're continually averaging more than a point per possession right now and why they have uh, what's fluctuated between a top 10, top 12 offense in terms of efficiency at Ken Palm. Man, great stuff there. Folks, keep your eyes on that in this Virginia game. Um, as we said, they are going to double Mondo hard, and he's going to have to be quick. He's going to have to be decisive, and other guys are going to have to knock down shots. All right, we're going to look very uh, specifically at Virginia, who they are, what Carolina's got to do to break this losing streak. We'll look at that in just a second. But first, this episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Hey, you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories? Well, then you got to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays, and I know that my goal right now is to eat healthier this year. If you're like me, where you want to eat healthier, but you don't want to compromise taste, Built Bar is the way to go. Seriously, it's so delicious, 
and they're good for you. It's perfect for a New Year's resolution. What makes Built Bars so good? Well, part of it is that they're covered in 100% real chocolate, and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro. I Come on, man. I need to try some of that churro action and peanut butter brownie. Not sure how Built does it, but the bars taste like a candy bar and still maintain amazing macros. 130 calories, just 4 grams of sugar, and yet 17 grams of protein. Best news of all, you don't have to just order it online anymore. Now, Sam's Club and Walmart are carrying Built Bars. So, just ride right on down to Walmart, right over there. Go get yourself a box of these churros, and then you're going to find me just plowing through them because they're so stinking good. And, of course, you can always still order online at Built.com. Go get yourself some bars today. Oh, folks, thanks again for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast on the Locked on Network, Locked on College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball all in one place. Plus, hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked on College Basketball, available now on YouTube and anywhere you get podcasts. So, Pac. As much as Roy Williams Tar Heels team struggled against uh, Virginia, uh, the exact opposite was true last season in Hubert Davis's first year um, as head coach with a little bit of that different style that you alluded to earlier. Two games they played last year, 74 to 58, Carolina won in the Smith Center. <laughs> Mondo went for 29 and 22 in that one, if you don't remember. And then in the ACC tournament, 63 to 43, Carolina wins by 20. But here's the thing, Pat Kilby. Neither of those games were in Charlottesville in John Paul Jones Arena. Why does that matter? Well, because as we've said multiple times now, Carolina is riding a seven game losing streak in Charlottesville dating back to January 6th of 2013. The last time they won pack was February 25th of 2012, a 54 to 51 victory. Trivia question for you. This is February of 2012. Who was the leading scorer in that game for the Tar Heels? Oh, gosh. February of 2012. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. You uh, went on to become ACC Player of the Year. Um, let's see here. Tyler Zeller? Yes, sir. Bingo. Leading rebounder in that game was somebody different, not Tyler Zeller. Um, One of the best – defenders best blockers in recent carolina history john henson yes sir and the leading assister in that game probably the most obvious of these is k butter k butter three for three my friend way to go <laughs> coach pat kilby i hope some of the rest of you out there got those answers correct as well anyway pat here's my question to you why does the hubert davis offensive scheme line up better against tony bennett's pack line defense and can they go get this win on the road? Let's take those one at a time first. Why does the Hubert Davis scheme work better? Well, for one, you know, Roy's scheme was so dependent on pace and pace of play that a Tony Bennett team is very, very disruptive, you know, and just slow brings down speed rather than speed bringing up slow. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a lot easier to dictate the game in a slower pace um, or into a slower pace. And so, I think that gave fits. But, you know, one thing that's been really effective for Hubert is kind of like what I talked about earlier. Yeah, we'll push the ball and we'll see if we can't get something in transition. But if not, he's got some of the best and most effective sets in the half-court setting in college basketball. That's right. um, and he just uniquely designs the offense to fit the, the skill sets of our players. And I think that that has, you know, has obviously benefited Carolina um, because then the pace, the pace of play doesn't really affect you. You know, you get into the half court, you still run your stuff, you execute what you do. Um, but also under Hubert, you know, especially last year, we kind of got rid of the two big system. We brought Brady in. He could stretch the floor, which, as we know, can can be a way to give Virginia problems. Um, and then we still have, you know, we still have some of that this year with, you know, if Nance plays, he has the capability to stretch it. And if we go to the three guard lineup, we still have the capability of stretching the floor. So 
I like the way we match up with them. The second part to your question, can we win on the road? That's the tough part. That's the tricky part. Obviously, you know, John Paul Jones Arena is, is a very tough place to go play. It's a very good team that we're playing against. And quite frankly, we haven't played very good on the road this year. So um, we haven't even literally zero true road wins this year so far. Oh, and three. Yeah. And, and that's that's my point here is can we do it? Absolutely. Will we do it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We'll find and, out. And to that point, in this seven game losing streak we're talking about, in those seven games, Carolina has averaged just 53.4 points. They've been held under 50 in each of the last four of those games. And six of those seven losses have been by nine or more points. And so, yeah, there's some bad juju for the Tar Heels, as you said, inside JPJ. Got to go and fix that, get it right, and uh, start a brand new streak. As for Virginia this year, they are 11-3 and three right now, 3-2, and two, ranked 13th in the nation in the new poll. Here, here's the thing, Pac. I don't really know what to make of them fully yet because as I look at their resume, their best wins – are against Baylor, who right now doesn't have a Big 12 win, against Illinois, who have literally flip-flopped win-loss, win-loss, win-loss for the last nine games. Sky Clark just left the program on Friday. They beat Michigan. Okay. they I mean, we did too, but Michigan can't figure themselves out. Syracuse. Um, and so Virginia hasn't beaten what I believe is a consistently good, legitimate team so far this season. Their losses, though, are all understandable, too. They lost uh, to Houston at home. Get that. They're the number one team in the nation right now. Miami at Miami. Miami is a great team. Uh, great backcourt play, similar to Carolina, so that might be a good omen. And then they lost to Pitt at Pitt. I know another team that did that already this season, and so... It's like I, I'm kind of struggling to fully grip um, what Virginia is, and it's almost like one of those where you don't really know until they step on the court together. Something something to keep in mind, as you said, I think I'm with you that Carolina should be able to score on Virginia. You know, you, you think of that defense that's been like a top 10 defense under Tony Bennett, and they were top 10 every year at Ken Palm, 2014 through um, 2020, the year that ended uh, pre uh, early with COVID. But they've been outside the top 20 each of the past three seasons. And so, I, you know what? I think I'm with you on that. And obviously that pace is going to be slow. 361st in pace in the nation out of 363 teams. And so it's going to be very slow. Now, Pac, when you look at the starting five, and there's really, uh, they have like a seven-man rotation, Virginia does. Starting five, Kihei Clark, Armand Franklin, Reese Beekman, who's the one that worries me the most, Jaden Garter, and Caden Shedrick. All five of these dudes are averaging between nine and 11 points. How how difficult does that make it for a coach to prepare uh, to prepare for as they're looking at breaking a team down? Yeah, balance is one of the the toughest things to coach against. You know, it's like because a lot of times what you see is a team that has maybe a dominant player like us, which is Armando, and you go, all right, let's cut the head off the snake, you know, and and go from there. But when you when you start talking about five guys that averaged nearly double figures, that's like, guy, you know, what do you do? What do you take away? And, you know, at the end of the day, here's the deal. You can't because balance is balance. It is what it is. You've just got to be really sound and solid in your principles. You've got to make them. Jay Billis talked about this a lot against Notre Dame. Tough contested twos. Yes. Run them off the three-point line. Yep. Let them get to the rim. Make them shoot over us. And then not allow second chances. And if we can do that, then we put ourselves in a great spot. And, and one of the hopeful things with that, what you just said about like tough contested twos and then grab the rebound, Virginia, who has been a really solid rebounding team, isn't that great this year on the glass. Jaden Gardner is the leading rebounder and he's getting just 5.3 rebounds per game. As a team, Virginia is averaging 32 and a half rebounds and Carolina, meanwhile, is just shy of 40 at 39.8. And so it's one of those where you got to go out and, and get the rebounds you need. Now, part of that, and we'll talk about this more, but if you roll the three guard lineup, obviously they rebound at not quite a high rate as if it's 
Pete Nance or a, a more traditional four in the lineup. And so we'll have to look at that. Obviously, Kihei Clark is, is the engine that makes this thing go. Leading score, leading assist man at 6.3, leading uh, in steals at 1.4. Um, and so, man, a lot of stuff to be aware of there. And uh, just similar to what Coach Davis did last year, we might find a special way to cut that head off the snake to use the language you just talked about, Pat Kilby. And that's where we want to go next. We're going to talk about what to watch for in this game and give you our game predictions coming up in just a second. All right, folks, we want to give you our four things, our WTW4, what to watch for in this game. And the first thing I want I want to say what to watch for is watch that defensive assignment right after the tip. Who is guarding Kihei Clark? If it's Leaky Black like it was last year, that could be a fun thing. Pack, do you think that was a big enough thing and caused enough problems for Virginia that Coach Davis would go back to it again this year? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'll be I'll be shocked if it's not Leaky Garden Kihei. And to be honest with you, when Leaky's tired and he needs a breather, then it'll be Puff or Trimble, and we'll keep a fresh body on him. We've got three guys that we can run at him. Um, and I that you know, I do feel good about that. And I definitely, definitely think it'll be, you know, Leaky starting on him and and just see if we can't give him some fits there. I think Leaky really bothered him last year with his Absolutely. length, Absolutely. you know, and uh, just, gosh, he's uh, he's so good at guarding the ball. But when he stops you, uh, you know, he's tough to shoot over because of his length. And so I think that really bothered him. And I think that that's, um, that's something we'll see again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just looking back to see what um, his numbers were in that ACC tournament game with Leakey chiefly on him. Yeah, Clark had three turnovers, oh, four rebounds, three for nine from the field, seven points. Um, still had four assists. So, you know, a pretty decent game there. But, um, yeah, should be cra- – I mean, Leakey literally has an 11-inch height advantage <laughs> over Kihei Clark. And so, um, now, obviously, Kihei Clark is not the only – this team shares the ball well. Um, and so, you know, y- you look at other guys who can do things with that too. But, again, if you can stop Kihei Clark from getting them into their offense, you got to feel good about what you're doing there the question is would they just start giving it to somebody else to initiate offense and what does that turn into so keep your eyes peeled for that that to me is the biggest um hmm in this game as we go into it number two uh pack you got into this one earlier a little bit and that is the fact that carolina's three-point percentage is starting to come up for the team and in particular rj davis rj and caleb notably were both below 30 percent earlier in this season caleb still is but rj is quietly up to 34.6 percent shooting from three now his career average is 35 percent and so I don't think that's getting really talked about enough. I certainly haven't, and I I haven't heard others talking about it either. In fact, his last four games, 12 of 25 from deep, 48%. And he's doing that with the second most attempts on the team, 78. Meanwhile, other guys on the team, Pete Nance is at 34% on the third most attempts. Leakey has the highest percentage of all qualified shooters, 37%. And then you got some guys shooting better, but with a small sample size. Puff is 5 of 11 right now, 45.5%. DeMarco Dunn is shooting 5 of 13 from 3, 38.5%. And so, Pac, the team has crept up just shy of 32%. It's not close to last year's 35.8%. I get that. You're still four percentage points behind that. But you're now safely above 30%, and you feel good about that. The big, huge, massive question mark is this. Caleb Love is still shooting 29% from three, and he's taken 107 of Carolina's 335 attempts. That's 31.9% of all of Carolina's team attempts. So the team is going up. Caleb's still kind of struggling. What do you see going forward with this? Well, I think the team's going to stay. I think they've pretty well leveled out to about where they're going to be. I still see RJ's continuing to climb to a certain extent. Um, You know, with Caleb, gosh, if we can get first halves like we got against Notre Dame consistently from him, then we'll see his start to climb. Yep. 
Um, and, and to be honest with you, I still think it cracks 30 percent, although I know it's it's a large sample size at this point. But, yeah, he's just too good of a shooter for it not to crack it for right. me. And, yeah. and I, I think at some point it's going to go and he's going to go on a on a hot streak that's been about like what his cold streak's been, you know, just the yep. polar opposite. Yep. Um, I, I do feel like that's going to happen. When it's going to happen, I don't know. But I know that we'll all be relieved when it finally does. <laughs> well, and, and like you said earlier, it really feels like it could go hand in hand with the the higher level of floor spacing and the higher level of playing through Armando. Um, because if, that def- if they can get that defense to collapse and just give – Caleb, some more rhythm threes, uh, some uh, more open looks, things like that. You got to feel good about that, allowing him to really get going. As you said, he's just too good a shooter to be where he is now. Uh, as I often say, I think better days are ahead for Caleb. Uh, but man, it's so good to see RJ getting back into the flow. Got to see him keep shooting and keep hitting. Another thing to watch for in this game is the bench production. Uh, we, we've we talked about it quite a bit. 22 points from the bench on Saturday against Notre Dame, including uh, 11 from Puff Johnson to lead that group. They shot 66.7% as a, as a unit from the floor and 50% from three. Uh, this is a, a different entity when you go to play Virginia. As we said, it's it's that five-man starting rotation plus Isaac McNeely, who's a true freshman, a really, really good shooter. And then you've also got Ben Vanderplas, a transfer from Ohio. Both those guys are going to get 20 minutes or so for the game. Um, so uh, kind of a small rotation for Virginia. What, what do you expect to see um, – about where we were with Notre Dame in terms of bench minutes and production, or you think it takes a downturn? I hope it's about where, you know, where Notre Dame was because I thought there the guys were were playing, the, the reserves were playing enough to get a flow and to get a rhythm and to really impact the game. And yep. Yep. boy, did they, you know, I mean, Puff did his thing and um, DeMarco played well off the bench and, had a great Jaylen. offensive rebound and put back. DeMarco did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they all just – they found ways to contribute. And so, um, you know, to me, I hope that Hubert saw that um, and, and relies on that and trusts that going into Virginia because it makes us better. And it gives Caleb and RJ and those guys no excuse to take plays off defensively because they, they have fresh legs. Yeah, and, yeah. To me, that's been a thing. Like that's been a, you know, obviously our role players have been needing to get some time because we're tired and we're exhausted and guys are averaging too many minutes and, you know, all that. But kind of the thing that kind of goes maybe unnoticed or goes undervalued is the plays they take off defensively because they're exhausted, you know. And to me, we can't afford to have that on Tuesday night. Like, I think we're going to score like we talked about. Can we get enough stops? Yep. And if we can do that, then we can win the game. And to me, the recipe for that is to trust our bench, yeah. let them come in and impact yep. the game. And I would, I got to imagine, Pac, what you just said there triggers something in me is those, those couple possessions where you kind of pull off a little bit, that's probably where those those stretches have been where Carolina hasn't stepped on the throat or stepped on the throttle and, and really – um, either held a lead or pushed it out, and they've allowed a team to come back. Like Notre Dame got back within seven in uh, in Saturday's second half. And so those kind of things, it's like uh, that level of defensive consistency allows Carolina um, to put a game away, basically, which they could do, um, should, should have done against Pittsburgh in the first half, for example, but didn't, and it came back to bite them down the stretch. And so we'll be watching for that in this game. Final what to watch for thing. We've talked a lot this week about this three guard lineup. And so we'll be all sorts of dialed in to does Pete Nance play in this game? Is he active? If so, does he start? If, if not, is it the, the same three guard lineup? But here's the thing I want to point out that we really haven't talked about much that, that I want to watch for is I I've talked so far quite a bit about it being those three guards, Davis, Love, and Trimble, along with Leakey and Mondo, because that's been the most consistent thing. Um, 
the the threesome of Davis, Trimble, and Love so far have played 93.4 minutes together per going back to Adrian Atkinson um, per his numbers. And when those that threesome is in the game, Carolina has an efficiency margin of plus 18.3 in those minutes. But it doesn't here. Here's the thing is I think it's come across that I'm saying this has to be the anti Pete Nance and it doesn't have to be. It could be those three guards along with Pete Nance and Armando Baycott. It could be those three guards along with Puff and, and Pete or whatever it is. So far, the three most common front court pairings along with that threesome are Leaky and Armando. The second most common is Pete Nance and Armando Baycott. And then the third most common is Puff and Baycott. So um, it's always so far been a ton of those three guards, Armando, and somebody else at the four. And so the question is, if and when Pete is back healthy, which we expect to see, do we see more of him at the five with somebody else at the four? Do we see more of the three guards with Pete and, and Mondo playing together too? Um, and so uh, really curious to see that. But one other thing Adrian Atkinson points out is that the, the 3G lineup, I've been calling it, has been elite at forcing turnovers, um, a turnover percentage forced of 19.1%, meaning they're forcing turnovers on essentially one out of every five possessions the opponent has. That's insane. But they've struggled on the glass with that lineup. And so there's a little give and take there. Pack, what I know you haven't really had much opportunity yet to kind of chime in your thoughts on the three guard lineup. What are you watching for with them on tonight's game against Virginia? Well, rebounding will definitely be probably number one on my list. Uh, I think Virginia is a team that's just, man, they're just so daggum gritty. And to me, a big key to beating them is to eliminate second chances. Yep. And with that three guard lineup, I, I expect to see a lot of it, to be honest with you. I think Nance probably plays. I'm not sure that he starts and that he plays a ton. That's yep. just a hunch. Yep. I don't have yep. a inside source or anything, just a hunch. But <laughs> uh, I, I so I expect to see a lot of the three guard. And to me, what what intrigues me is can we rebound? Yep. Um, and then how do we handle um on the offensive end, there's going to be an intense defensive pressure that we haven't seen yet, you know, just because that's what Virginia does. Um, and that double on the post isn't going to look like a Notre Dame double on the post. <laughs> that's then, a good point. Can Kate Trimble, Kedrick is coming. Yeah. And so can Trimble and Davis and Love, can they hit enough shots? And can they attack the rim enough and create enough offense that gives us a chance to win? Yep. And, and move the yeah. ball quickly without allowing Virginia to recover off of those doubles. Yes, absolutely. But and, and and that's what I like about it though, is we have guys out there like Trimble. He just seems to make the right play. Ball doesn't stick. Yep. And RJ does the same. And so um I feel comfortable with the three guard lineup. And I actually think it gives us the best chance to win. I agree with you, uh, particularly against Virginia. I think it's great. I said on yesterday's show, I don't want the three guard lineup to be matchup dependent. I, I think it's like, hey, you got to match us because we're doing this unique thing. Good luck to you. But particularly, I'm with you against Virginia. I think it could be a massive help to overcoming Tony Bennett's team. Pack Bet Online has this game Virginia minus four. What you got? Oh, heels straight up. <laughs> Yes. Up. Will they crack 50? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think they crack 65. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, th I think Carolina is able to get up over 60 and, and it's not a, a runaway by any stretch of the imagination, but I really legitimately feel like they win this game, break the seven game losing streak and get out of Virginia with like a five point win or something like that, like 65, 60, if we're kind of going with those numbers you were just talking about there. And so uh, be really interesting to see what happens in this one. Well, folks, great conversation today, getting ready for this Virginia game. Buckle up. It's another late one. I will be with you after the game for a live postcast. Unfortunately, Pat can't join us. He'll be coming home from a game himself. Bummer Reno right there. Well, uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow PAC at Coach underscore K23. You can follow me at Isaac Shade. Shoot us an email, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. And all sorts of good emails are starting to flood in. I love it. And I'm so grateful. Great nominations for Heel of the Week and Heel of the Week. 
keep all that coming as well. Don't forget to subscribe, smash the like button, leave us your comments. We want to know your thoughts on these things, your prediction on the game score, all of that. For your second listen, once again, check out the brand new podcast, Locked on College Basketball. College basketball experts, Isaac Shade, I didn't write it, I'm just reading what they tell me, and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Locked on College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for Spart spending part of your Tuesday hanging out with Coach Pat Kilby, hanging out with me, and we want to remind you that it is always a great day to be a Tar Heel. You know it, folks. And you know what? Until tomorrow or until tonight, if you tune in to the postcast, peace.